events this year. Uh, those who previously attended this event, um, I think we're, we're used to being in a room sometimes with warm wine, um, but instead we're starting pretty early and I hope everyone has their own attempt at conference coffee. Um, now, what we'll be talking about today is an uh, issue we know is close to the Prime Minister's heart, or at least his policy agenda. Um, this is going to be the Associated British Ports Fringe, and it's the big northern transport fringe, and we're going to be talking about levelling up the north. Now, we discussed the aim previously, but I think what's interesting is since last year's Tory conference, we've clearly seen the Prime Minister uh, go further in his level up agenda. It's very clear he wants to make that his flagship domestic agenda and transport infrastructure in the north is a key part of that. But we've also seen a global pandemic, which has changed the way we travel. Uh, we are seeing new hurdles now for the transport industry and for those who even want to use it. Uh, Passenger journeys virtually disappeared during lockdown. Uh, confidence in public transport is at an all time low still. And when we're looking ahead and I suppose planning to the future, things like social distancing don't and working from home don't look as though they're about to go anywhere anytime soon. So, and on top of that, we also have a push for more environmental transport, looking at uh, low carbon options, which all have to be taken into account in the planning. So I'm going to uh, introduce our panel in a second, but I think and we're going to look at the questions we're going to ask. But I think ultimately in today's panel, uh, one of the key things is, do we need to reset the level up agenda in the north? Do we need to look at a, a recommitment or do we have to actually change some of the goals here to, to go with events? And um, so with that, I would like to, oh, housekeeping very quickly, we are going to be recording today's session. So if anyone does have any issue with that, just let us know uh, in the chat function, um, but we'll be sharing it online later on. Okay. And then just to, uh, and then as we get to the panel, I'm going to ask all the panelists to mute themselves when they're not talking, um, but you will be brought in, I promise. And uh, as we go on in the session, we're going to have two mini panels, uh, sometime a crossover. Um, we will be taking questions from the audience, and there are two ways you can do that. One is by writing in the chat function, which is probably the simplest if you have, have a thought then and we can go back to it, or we can try uh, raising a hand and doing a live audio question later on. Um, but if you have questions as we go, do write them in the chat function. Now I'm just going to introduce our first panel of the day. Okay. I think we have a slide for that. Um, so delighted to be joined by, here we go. We, yeah, I've got photos, brilliant. Um, so delighted to be joined by uh, Tees Valley Mayor Ben Houchen, Tim Wood, Northern Powerhouse Director, Transport for the North, Andy Brown, Corporate Affairs Director, Manchester Airport Group, and Kevin Hollenrake, the MP for Thurston Melton. Now, we have a second panel joining us uh, ago, and I'll introduce it as we get to that point halfway through the session, but obviously do, do stick around for that. Um, and with that, I just want to now just hand over various bits here for, we're gonna go for a first address. Yeah, brilliant. So now we're going to hear from Simon Bird, Regional Director at Humber for Associated British Ports. Um, and Simon, if we could just have some opening remarks from you, looking you know, how can we level up and deliver better transport in the north, um, given all the factors that we mentioned? Thanks, Katie. I, 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 I'll, I'll make some remarks about an ABP and, and what we do in the north and our views on, on some of the issues that are, that are bouncing around at the present time. So ABP is the largest port owner and operator. We manage 21 ports around the country, handling around a quarter of the nation's trading goods. In the north of England, ABP operates the ports of Barrow, Garston, Silleth, Fleetwood in the northwest, and Hull, Gould, Grimsby and Immingham on the Humber, which is the UK's busiest trading estuary and a vital trading gateway to the European market. Immingham, where I am today, is the UK's largest port by tonnage, and the Humber ports collectively constitute the largest port complex in the UK, facilitating 75 billion of trade every year, more than the Tyne, Tees and Mersey combined. The UK ports have played a vital role in ensuring the continued free flows of food, goods and medical supplies during the pandemic. Our ports can now play a central role in driving the economic recovery and levelling up in the north. Ports themselves have a critical role to play in driving the green economy, and this role is even more important in the context of the UK's changing trading relationship with Europe. 
On the Humber, ABP has recently invested 50 million pounds to expand the container terminals at the ports of Hull and Immingham to support growing trade with Europe and to provide chain supply chain resilience for traders in the events of disruption in the Southeast. By facilitating trade growth, our ports can make a significant contribution to economic recovery in the North. Increasing trade through the Humber ports means not only more jobs in Hull and Grimsby, but also Sheffield, Leeds and Manchester. Moving more cargo directly through the northern ports can also bring significant environmental benefits and carbon savings by reducing road miles and congestion. In fact, moving just 10% of cargo from the port of Dover to the Humber could save in the region of 100,000 tonnes of CO2 to locations. In addition to facilitating trade flow, ports can also serve as sites for new economic activity. An ambitious policy to establish free ports around the UK can further enhance the potential of ports to drive economic activity and decarbonisation by attracting new investment in renewable energy hubs and port-centric manufacturing. Combined with coordinated investment in infrastructure, the policy has the potential to create high quality and long-term jobs in ports and coastal communities. ABP ports on the Humber in Southampton and in South Wales are well placed to turn this ambition into a reality turning already busy gateways for international trade into engines for regional economic growth. Leveling up the economy requires investment in transport infrastructure in the north, particularly access to rail freight and mass transportation to improve connectivity for people and businesses, facilitate modal shift and reduce emissions. Building HS2 will create a massive amount of space on the existing railway by placing high speed services on their own tracks. Once HS2 is operating, more freight can travel by rail, improving motorway safety, air quality, and helping to reduce carbon emissions. Each freight train moves up to 70, removes up to 76 lorries from our roads, which currently amounts to 1.66 billion fewer kilometers a year by heavy goods vehicles, or more than 7 million lorry journeys. Rail freight also has a key role to play in the low carbon economy, as rail produces 76% less of CO2 emissions than the equivalent road journey. Improving east-west connectivity across the Pennines is another essential step towards accelerating green economic growth in the north. The investment in the Trans-Pennine route upgrades are welcomed and the electrification between Manchester and Leeds is a great start to the electrification programme. Investment in gauge enhancement to enable the efficient movement of containers by rail from the Humber ports to the northwest would boost trade while relieving congestion on the M62 corridor, one of the most congested strategic highways we have in the UK. Further electrification schemes to connect the East Coast to the Northwest are needed to deliver improved journey times for passengers, as well as access for trade, alongside the necessary reductions in emissions. AB put B ports are well placed to support the wider drive towards decarbonisation, both in terms of their own operations and in facilitating the green transition through the supply chain. 17 of our 21 ports now have renewable energy projects producing clean energy for port operations, our customers and the national grid. We have invested over 25 million in solar on our warehouses with over 12 megawatts of installed capacity on the Humber alone. Our ports are also vital in, in enabling the continued growth of the offshore wind sector, supporting manufacturing, assembly, installation, operations and the maintenance across our sites. Huge growth potential with benefits of a significant jobs creation in coastal communities. And we all look forward to hearing what the Prime Minister says on that later. The maritime sector is calling on government to, to dedicate one billion in the upcoming spending review to accelerate the development of green technologies and to support the UK in becoming a global leader in maritime decarbonisation. This investment could create up to 75,000 jobs and support efforts to reach net zero in the wider economy. In developing hydrogen, alternative fuels and carbon capture, utilisation and storage, our ports are at the forefront of supporting decarbonisation in the wider supply chain and industry. In this role, and in many other roles, ports can play an increasingly important part in helping to deliver the high skilled jobs in communities across the Northwest and towards levelling up the economy uh, in the North generally. I have to take any questions and, and, and join the debate. Brilliant. And um, thank you, Simon. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more about Freeports and Ben, who has long been a champion of Freeports alongside the Chancellor, uh, Rishi Sunak. Now, um, I want to go to the panel and just get some opening remarks. Um, but just before we do, I'm going to tell you about our Twitter hashtag. Uh, the hashtag, uh, 
you probably have guessed this is hashtag leveling up and if you want to follow the accounts uh, at avports21 or um, at Devo Connect, um, then you can see a, a blogging and live tweeting of discussion and join in that way as well so do join in online as well and just to remind just enter them into the chat function any questions um, now let's start um, I think we'll start with you Ben if that's okay if you're ready to unmute yourself um, to ultimately just touching on some of the things in the opening remarks what we just heard from Simon and I think questions for this discussion which is you know ultimately how can we level up and deliver better transport for the north what does the North need to do to build back better transport? And how does it have to adapt to coronavirus? And we'll go into all the specifics of these, but if you want to just give us your opening remarks, Ben, we'd be very grateful. Thanks, Katie, appreciate that. Uh, I think Simon set the scene very well, actually, um, for the overall context of what levelling up could be, especially in the transport context. I think the starting point has to be, though, that unfortunately, because of coronavirus, we are uh, now a year behind where we'd like to be. Um, you know, Boris came to power in December, promising levelling up, promising to see a sea change in those red wall seats that, that backed him and gave him the majority that he's got. And, uh, you know, six, eight weeks later, um, coronavirus hit. And I think it's fair to say that the government's time has been completely preoccupied with trying to manage coronavirus, uh, the lockdown, then the emergence of the lockdown, and then the impact on the economy. And, uh, you know, as a result, the levelling up agenda has, has not um, got the the time and attention that it that it needs and people can understand why uh, but I think there is an opportunity and I think they saw the budget that's now been delayed as the opportunity to reset that but obviously with the further increase in cases it's looking like it will probably be a spring budget um, that will hopefully reset the conversation because I'm very 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 um, confident that both number 10 number 11 and, and the whole government really want to get back to this leveling up agenda because they think that's the thing in the medium term that gets them to win the next election. I mean, very, very bluntly, they want to win another election and that's the way they're going to deliver it. Um, they've already committed to things like Northern Powerhouse Rail, which I think there's a really detailed conversation to have about uh, expectation management of people in the north of England, what that actually delivers in what period of time. Um, I would encourage the government, and I think there's, a, there's an awareness of this through the acceleration unit that, that Grant has now set up, that there are some quick wins that could be had in the north of England around our infrastructure, railroad in particular, um, that could be badged up as Northern Powerhouse, levelling up, that would give the government the goodwill of the public to be able to manage some of these longer term projects like HS2 uh, and Northern Powerhouse Rail as well. Uh, but ultimately, I mean, I've, I've been a firm believer that le levelling up can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, but really what it is, it's, it's something physically material to the public that they can, you know, the government can point out in three and a half years time and say, this is what levelling up is. Uh, because a lot of the, when we talk about levelling up, we talk about places like the Humber, we talk about places like Teesside, large parts of the Northwest that have, felt, have been left behind for decades. You know, they never felt the economic boom of the early 2000s, never really saw the uptick in the economy. Um, you know, job, job creation went up slightly, but there was no material benefit to people in the region. And the economic impacts that the, the communities like ours felt over that period of time didn't feel like we were being dragged along with what the goodwill and the good feeling in the country was. So I think people need to be able to see in a couple of years time that station that's been upgraded or more frequent train services or a better bus service or physical manufacturing facilities that have been built that have created jobs that your husband, your wife, your daughter may have got a job and therefore set a career up. They need to see some physical things. I think launching strategies launching kind of ideas, launching um, policy papers isn't, isn't really going to cut it. And I think it's about how, and it's the one thing that Rishi in particular is looking at um, about this growth. He's, he's kind of set up a growth board with a lot of the cabinet ministers to say, how do you accelerate these big infrastructure projects as quickly as possible, rather than getting bogged down in the bureaucracy? Because there is a lot of that. And a lot of that is often caused by the politics, especially in the north of England, which means that there can never be a single decision on what we should or, should or shouldn't be doing. And a lot of that slows it down as well. So it's multifaceted. I think we'd be having a much more positive conversation now if it wasn't for coronavirus. But I don't think that will stop us from having a very positive conversation in the months and years ahead once the government are able to give levelling up the full attention that it needs and deserves and they want to give it. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. Um, and with that, and I also just, I suppose, looking back, I remember, Ben, when I came up to interview you uh, just before, uh, obviously, the pandemic hit, and it did feel like levelling up was going to be all we were talking about this year in Westminster, and then a few weeks later, and it feels what mad that you were even allowed to travel at that point. <laughs> um, so uh, with that, I think let's go to Tim, uh, obviously, Northern Powerhouse Director, um, picking up, I mean, Ben was talking about some of the things that could be done to repackage some certain projects so I'd lo love to hear your thoughts on that as well as your opening remarks. Oh well, thank you very much I think if I just go to my uh, opening remarks first of all uh, I think that's really important just to sort of uh, set the context really. Um, NPR is a program uh, approaching some key milestones with big decisions uh, to be made in our preferred network that will present to government in March 2021. Investment in rail infrastructure now will help to provide long-term certainty and get the economy moving in the wake of COVID-19 crisis. It's true that we have seen a contraction in passenger numbers over the past months, but we're really planning for the long term, for the rest of the 21st century and beyond. We cannot let the temporary shock of the pandemic affect our planning for decades to come. In the development of Northern Powerhouse Rail, we're asking for the North to be freed from that straitjacket of poor infrastructure that has constrained its economy and its prospects for far, far too long. We need to consolidate planning and development across the North into one process to level up the British economy. I like to use the analogy of the plane flying with just one engine and refer to our country's economy. At the moment, we're just too heavily reliant on that one engine, London and the South East. It's not just a gap, it's actually a chasm, but the north of England has huge untapped potential, properly resourced, can really help redress that imbalance. By 2040, the north of England will have a world-class railway network, helping underpin a world-class economy. We must meet this challenge if we are to help and grow the northern economy. We can only do this if northern transport organisations, combined and local authorities and private businesses absolutely work together to help meet the future needs of the skills and going forward to actually drive that economy into a far better place. At Transport for North, we think we're ideally placed to make that collaboration happen. We need to bring short and long-term projects together in a continuous pipeline of investment from now until 2040. And I'm not just talking about Northern Powerhouse Rail. This should include road investment, local connectivity and active travel plans to meet the decarbonisation agenda. Transport is the largest emitting sector, producing 27% of all UK green, uh, sorry, all UK greenhouse gas emissions. But rail is by far the most carbon efficient mass transit system available. In 2017, greenhouse gas emissions from road transport made up around a fifth, 21% of all the UK's total uh, GHC uh, emissions. By contrast, rail accounts for less than 1% of overall carbon emissions and we just talked that we just heard simon say every extra freight train takes that 76 lorries off the rail i think just going back to ben's points he hit the nail on the head we're absolutely ready to go in northern powerhouse rail we're already on with two stations we're already on with the survey work between hull and leeds we want to get those spades in the ground in 2024 25. do i no i don't really actually I want to get them in the ground next year. But how can I do that? How can we look at what happened for the Nightingale hospitals? Just nine days and a hospital was done. What a fantastic opportunity. Why can't we have our Nightingale moment in the railways? Why can't Ben stations up there in Middlesbrough and Darlington get done far quicker? We need to break down these procedures that we've got in place and actually kickstart this economy. It's the right place. It's the right time. And we should have that investment. Thank you, Katie. Brilliant. Thanks, Tim. Um, now I, I'm going to ask a few questions, but I'm just going to continue with the opening remarks. Siren in my background. Hopefully, okay. Um, Andy, uh, let's go to you now, Corporate Affairs Director at the Manchester Airport Group. Thanks, Katie. <clears throat> I'll keep it uh, relatively brief. I think there are two points I wanted to make in opening. Uh, one is the importance of international connectivity to the north in driving that, that levelling up agenda. Um, Tim, Tim and I and our teams work closely together on uh, our contribution to HS2 and Northern Powerhouse Rail. Um, I think for a lot of people, Northern Powerhouse Rail, uh, they, they gravitate towards the element of that that is 
uh, connecting our cities together to allow commuting and, and interactivity between the northern cities. That's really important, but so is the access for all of our northern cities to key international markets for tourism and for business. I think if we can crack on as fast as we can with delivering those schemes so that you can get access to key hubs like Manchester Airport, we'll seriously be able to allow businesses to get from whether it's Leeds to Los Angeles or Bradford is what drives economic value and prosperity. A really good example for us for that is we fought for a long time to win direct connections from Manchester Airport to China in the two years after uh, we established the link to Beijing. We saw exports from Manchester increase by 40% to China. Similar increase in terms of Chinese tourists coming to the north. Uh, and these are some of the highest spending, highest value tourists you can find. And to put it bluntly, those increases did not come from the many connections that the South and London had to China. We've had them for years. They came from when the North had that direct connectivity. So it's really important that we see the value of that and that we do what we can through, through schemes like uh, Northern Powers Rail to really drive that connectivity model to make sure the North has its direct connectivity that it needs. The second thing I wanted to say is more sort of timely, but I've been, we've been making that argument about international connectivity for many years. But uh, in the context of coronavirus, the importance of making sure that we do what we can now in policy terms to protect the infrastructure that we have got. Um, I'm sure it will be no surprise to anyone here to hear the tough time that airports in particular are having alongside other hard hit sectors like hospitality. Uh, we're really encouraged to hear some of the positive noises from government over the last few days about a testing regime that would allow quarantine to be uh, more targeted more scalpel-like in its application in the UK. I think we, uh, particularly in MAG and across the UK airport and aviation sector, need to see some movement on that as quickly as possible so that we can get back to working as a sort of private sector with that commercial drive to recovering that connectivity as, as quickly as possible. So that's what I'm watching out for this week. Brilliant, thank you. And now finally, last but not least, uh, let's go to Kevin for his opening remarks. Yeah, thanks very much, Catherine. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the key point I would like to make is uh, just picking up a point Ben made is, you know, the, the frustration around the timescales this will take. But the, probably the best analogy, if we were talking about levelling up, um, and perhaps in the context of transport, is that the best analogy, I think, for, for levelling up the UK is East, East and West Germany which took $2 trillion, $2 trillion and three decades. It's, it's a huge undertaking. And we're all frustrated, we wanna get things going quickly, but it is so massive. And I think we've got to look at it on that scale. It is not something we're gonna do in a few years time. And much as we might think of leveling up as new train stations and new railways and new roads, and there's new roads I wanna see in my patch, definitely. But I think people are only gonna recognize leveling up when their living standards improve when they have better jobs, better economic, economic outcomes. And the reality is the living standards in the North are 50% lower on average than the, than the South. And that's because of course, the in the South, London, the Southeast is economically more active. GDP per capita is 45,000 pounds per capita in London, the Southeast, 18,000 in the Northeast. And that's the trend we've got to reverse. And we look at the UK and think we're a very prosperous country with fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. Per capita, we're 27th in the world. Um, so those are the kind of issues we've got to try and tackle. And, um, and yes, public sector investment is hugely important in transport and all the things that have been talked about, things like Northern Paris Rail and road networks. A64 in my patch, I'll just put a plug in for, but... Um, but also, but a very good piece by Mark Littlewood from the IEA in the Times a few months ago now, he said, if prosperity was all about connectivity, why isn't Doncaster more prosperous? And I think it's a very good point. We've got to look at this. It's not simply going to be public sector investments going to do this. Yes, it's very, very important. Yes, we've only been getting one pound per capita versus three pound per capita if, if, on that ratio um, over the last few years and last five years. Uh, that we've spent more on the 9 million people who live in London than the 15 million people 
who live in the north just simply wrong and we need to redress that balance and it's great to see <clears throat> this this is decades of underinvestment in the north of course it's not this government or the last government every government's doing it this way and that's why we've got the probably most divided economically divided country in the eu in fact that's that's what andy haldane said we were in his one of his recent speeches Andy Haldane, the chief economist at the Bank of England. So, um, but this is going to take time. And yes, the public sector investment. So we need to look at the green book, of course, so that we're not my, back to my road. My, I was told by Highways England that um, my duelling of the, of the A64 carriageway was competing with the Oxford Cambridge corridor and the Lower Thames crossing. And how is it ever going to compete with that? It's simply uh, the, the decisions are made on the wrong basis. We've got to do that. Uh, we've got to re revise the workings of the Green Book, and the Treasury's kind of model for where it spends its money. We've also got to deliver these projects, Northern Paris Rail and others, and, uh, and lots of other interconnectivities that has been mentioned before. Um, you know, I think, this, I think Tim said, you know, I think if you look at somewhere like Blackpool compared to Brighton, Blackpool's closer to Manchester than Brighton is to London. Yeah, it, it takes 20 minutes longer to get there from Manchester, and the journey time, journeys are three times more frequent. These are the kind of uh, these are the kind of investments we need, need alongside the high, high, uh, the big ticket, big ticket items. Um, but the other thing we've got to do that we I don't think we talk enough about is find ways to get the private sector investing. So back to Mark Littlewood's point: How do we? If it's got to come along, private sector investment has got to come alongside public sector investment. So. Yes, free ports is a great idea. That will definitely help. And that's a way to get private sector investment in some of our ports. Great to see that in Teesport. But um, lots of places across the north we need to level up and across the Midlands we need to level up in are not going to be free ports. They might benefit some of the knock-on effects, but we need other things too. And I'd like to see um, us have a, a league table in terms of economic, economic activity or contribution across the country of every devolved region. So every mineral devolved region and pick the bottom quartile of the bottom half and say to those areas, well, you're super enterprise zones. So businesses who set up in your area get business rates uh, benefits, they get capital allowance benefits, they get planning reforms. Um, so really to attract business, private sector investment in those areas, um, we need to perhaps uh, enterprise investment scheme enhanced tax breaks in those areas to encourage businesses to set up in those areas and scale up in those areas. I think we need to see things like regional mutual banks. I do a lot of work in the banking sector in Parliament. Our, our economy is, is unique in its reliance on the top four banks for SME finance. Lots of other countries, including Germany, have this regional mutual banking system that has a much more patient approach to its SME financing. So uh, I can really see uh, Tees Valley uh, Mutual Bank um, providing SME finance and infrastructure finance indeed to, uh, to, key, to key businesses and key projects uh, across uh, areas such as that. Um, and a great new idea from a guy called Gareth Davis, one of my colleagues in parliament, the British Development Bank that could fund private sector a private sector could fund uh, infrastructure projects through raising of bonds which don't go on the government's balance sheet. It's a different way to finance kind of projects. So um, very exciting time. Levelling up agenda is, I know, is as important now as it was at the election, but, um, but it's going to take time and we need, I say, not just the public sector, we need the private sector to come in alongside it. Brilliant, thank you. And we've already got questions coming in, which is great. So if you ha do have any, just write them in the chat function. I'll, I'll try and get through as many as as, ma as many as we have time for. Um, also, just in terms of our panel, I can see you all. So if I ask a question and you really want to have your say, if you wave, um, I will be able to bring you in. Um, now, I thought um, actually maybe just to begin with you, Tim, one of the things I wondered was, I mean, we've spoken about how coronavirus means you know, the level up agenda has been impacted. It can't be the first thing the government thinks about when you're thinking about a uh, global pandemic, hospitals, et cetera. Um, but what about what it means for how we travel in the long term? Because lots of people say actually the drop in footfall, the reduction in people using public transport services, that's not, a, that's not a quick thing. That's a new long-term trend. So you could contend 
there is less of a need uh, for you know uh, new transport infrastructure. I wonder what you say to that. So there is definitely a contraction in the amount of people using the trains and the footfall in the stations, without a doubt. But our programmes are long-term programmes. They take years to actually be built and give thousands of jobs to people that will be needing those uh, positions. But there's a lot more behind it. It's about the decarbonisation agenda. I talked about the train uh, and the ability of the train to move vast amounts of people quickly across the north of England. That's what Northern Powerhouse Rail uh, and HS2 are all about. They're economic schemes. They're not transport per se. And we need to make sure that those programmes uh, are balanced off with the funding that will be available uh, to build these build these schemes in a, in, in a value for money way. But what that does, it starts to really open up the economy. You know, we want some of those great jobs that we see down in the southeast up here in the north of England. We've got some world-class industries already here, really growing, you know, particularly uh, Mayor Houchin uh, and his area, very, very key to the hydrogen agenda, the development of the hydrogen trains. And the other thing as well is, it's about the modal shift. We want to get people out of those fossil fuel vehicles and onto our trains so they can move seamlessly between the key city regions and economic centers in the north of England. So there's a far bigger picture here but what does it do? Well, actually, it helps us in a way that we can get out earlier on track. We might not have as many trains running. We can also build in that freight agenda, particularly with Simon. You know, if we're electrifying Hull to Leeds, then there must be another part to electrify to the port of Hull. So you're running full electric trains right the way through. Again, that decarbonisation piece. So although we are seeing uh, uh, this awful pandemic uh, and really affecting passenger numbers and the government actually still investing, keeping the railways going, I think what the important bit is, it gives us opportunity to make sure that these long term projects we're looking ahead into the future as people move back onto infrastructure. What do they really want? They just want really good public transport and they'll use it. Thank you. Simon, did I see your hand wave? Oh. No, you, uh, you did. I just wanted to say on the on the transport side, uh, to, uh, we, we uh, along with Liverpool supply biomass to Drax power station. It takes a train twelve hours to get from Liverpool to Drax over here in in East Yorkshire. Uh, it takes a truck from Hull four and a half hours to Manchester and and five five hours to Liverpool. If you take the trucks off the M62, you create a lot more capacity for people in in cars like. And I absolutely take Tim's point that we want to move away from, from fossil fuels. But this east-west connectivity is key. We, and it isn't Leeds Hull, it's, it's Humber Merseyside uh, going through Manchester to, to the two big ports on the east and west coast. But the UK or the north is fed by the south. If you look at how many thousands of trucks come through the, the channel ports carrying goods which are destined for the M62 corridor, the argument that we're putting back is that you can, there are different routes in, especially with the potential congestion around Dover in the light of whatever Brexit determines in, in terms of custom regulations. The Humber is much better placed to, to handle those trade flows to, to serve the north, and uh, the north being the north, the, the Midlands, uh, up into uh, Scotland and uh, yeah, up into Scotland. Great, thank you. I'm just going to bring in Ben now. I know you want to respond, but Ben, just also just on that. I mean, I just, I just wondered, do, do you think that we have to reimagine what level up is if people are using less transport? Or do you think this is a short term trend? I think I do. I think it's a short term trend. I think um, obviously public transport is going to be used less in the middle of a pandemic when the government are warning you to avoid crowds and staying away from people and social distancing. But the argument will be that as we get through the other side of this, it will come back. I don't buy into this idea that the new normal is we're all going to sit at our computers at our dining room tables and nobody shall ever go out and meet anybody again. That's just not the way it's going to work. And we're already seeing that with some of the big players in London looking for new HQs. I think it was JP Morgan came out earlier this week and are on the search for a new HQ in London. Um, so I, I don't believe that that will happen. And I think we do still, I think now actually is the time because as you've got to reduce demand, there is an ability to accelerate some of these projects. So as Tim will go into the, if you wanted him to, could go into the detail about blockades in the north of England, which would disrupt many millions of people. Whereas actually, if people are not using public transport as much, maybe now is the time to accelerate some of that investment. Um, and I also think it's fair to say, yes, I completely agree with Kevin as well. These things are slightly longer term. You're not going to turn around the north of England in the next two to three years, not by the next general election. But what you can do 
And it's what the way I think government needs to start thinking is it's got some big long term projects like here just to the northern powerhouse rail, but it needs to it needs to pair them off against some short term wins to demonstrate real progress. So if you can demonstrate some quick wins, then the, the public will buy into and give government the goodwill for the long term wins. And a lot of it as well is about communication. So I think the biggest problem, for example, with HS2 is the fact that everybody said it was going to be high speed rail and it was going to get you to London from Birmingham in you know 15 minutes quicker than it would have done. And people don't really get that. Whereas actually, if you said it was about capacity and you can run more trains, more frequent trains, move more people or put more freight onto the rail network, which takes more trucks off the roads, then I think that's something that the public can get their head around rather than this, what was quite an arbitrary thing of you know, 12, 15 minutes or whatever it is in journey time. So I think all of that plays a part. And then the, the final point I just wanted to make, because we talk about you know, needing more public transport, trains are going to be the panacea, especially when it comes to low carbon. Actually, I think we're going to be very careful not to say that one mode of transport is going to be a winner over another. You know, if I was going to make an argument, my argument would be that why do we want to put more people on trains? Because in the future, diesel cars, petrol cars are going to go out of existence in the next 15 years, and they're going to replace with battery cars or potentially hydrogen cars as well. So actually, they could become much cleaner than current rail travel, albeit then rail travel could lead to hydrogen trains, battery trains. So I think it's about, again, it's, it's about creating the infrastructure that allows investment to be made. And rather than saying we are going to do X, Y, and Z, if you create the environment for it, typical conservative uh, policy, create the environment for it, the private sector will come. Uh, but what the private sector needs is certainty over the type of investment, whether that is in public transport, whether that's in aviation, whether that's in low carbon, the government needs to take some decisions on the direction of travel so it gives the confidence to the private sector to plow in behind it because there's plenty of money out there at the minute but it doesn't really know where it wants to go because it's not quite sure because of the coronavirus pandemic which direction of travel this government's going in. Andy I might, I might bring you, you in at this point do you agree with what Ben's saying there and do you think it is possible to get that clarity right now realistically we're going to have to wait a bit longer? Yeah, I completely agree about the need for certainty. I think um, I think there's a lot of uh, private ingenuity and money waiting to go into the things that uh, we can be confident are the right place to focus our efforts. But there's no way that we can make any sorts of uh, investments with with not knowing what the, the future looks like. Um, what, can can we have that certainty now? Um, I think it's very difficult right now. Obviously. Um, I think we need to uh, set out some, we've, we've got some clear strategies uh, from people like Transport for the North. I think we can make um, in principle commitments to that. Uh, and uh, we need to get through the immediate period of coronavirus and then really double down on that and go as fast as possible. I think there's really something in what Ben's saying about uh, going now while the disruption will be less. Um, and actually I spend about half my time in, in London and you see that that is happening in London and all the roads are being dug up in London. So you sort of want to scream and go, this is the opportunity to power ahead with some of the much more important investment in the North. Yeah, I have so many roads being dug up around my flat. I can actually leave my flat today. So <laughs> it's like somebody pending. Now, uh, let's uh, go to just a few of the bits of feedback we've had so far. We'll do a proper question session at the end, but I just want to make sure we're feeding them into the discussion. So Kevin, we have um, Jill Morris uh, says, how can we get the treasury to look at the green book and accelerate investment? She liked your point about Doncaster. Yeah, well, the Treasury are working on it now. I mean, it's one of the frustrations of government, I suppose, that things take longer than you'd like them to. Um, but it's the way we've done things for so long. I think you can understand where we need to make sure we get that right so it doesn't push out some kind of unforeseen consequences. But <clears throat> the Green Book's been so powerful at locking in investment and in infrastructure in London and the South East and, and therefore... Um, pretty much making sure that the, the north of England and the Midlands didn't get that. So it's Treasury's got it in its, uh, its to-do pile. It's um, it's working right now. Hopefully we'll get something this year, early next year, so that decisions are made on a different basis. Um, but um, I mean, just on the point about will this, will COVID ha have a profound long-term effect in terms of the way people work? I, I think I'm in agreement with the other members of the panel, really, is that it's... Um, it's, I think it's more likely to be a short-term effect. So you look at London now with the traffic. I went from Parliament to King's Cross the other day. It took me an hour in a taxi. And the traffic is back on the roads here. And um, 
And I think it'd be the same with public sector transport. So the government, quite rightly, I think at times gets criticism for not thinking long term. It's thinking long term now in terms of levelling up, which is probably decades of investment. And we've got to push through with that. Right now, Tim, am I, am I right in thinking you have to go? Um, Tim, with uh, I've got a, I've got a, yes. I've been in the meeting, but I, but I, I, you know, I'm happy to stay a little bit longer if there's if there's some uh, sort of specific questions, Katie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can stay, great, brilliant. Just wave at me when you need to go, and and, and we'll get to that. Um, I suppose just very quickly, Tim, before I just take in some of the other questions, what do you say to Ben's point about the idea that you know? We shouldn't just be focusing on trains. Clearly, yeah, you have your brief here, but uh, we need to be thinking about how different uh, forms of transport can help each other. And actually, it's more of a group thing. I think the, the really interesting point, and you know, Ben is uh, is vice chair of uh, transport for the north. We actually set out a uh, an STP, uh, you know, a transport plan for the future for the next thirty years, uh, and it was very clear there that it talks about roads, rail sort of smart ticketing and actually the whole transport piece. And I think what's been really important is the government is already moving on um, looking at the, the state of the union in terms of transport. So Sir Peter Hendy's just been uh, appointed to, uh, to, to, to run that review. So we're looking at it holistically. And I think that's important. You know, the railways, you do one thing at Doncaster Station, it will affect the rest of the railways because the railways is a system. Uh, and you've got to make sure that you actually look at it holistically. So therefore, you are getting that real economic benefit across the network for doing each of the pieces of work uh, to go forward. And that uh, transport plan that, that we developed is all based on evidence. So the evidence is laid out. We've worked with all our members uh, and our various committees across the north uh, to generate that document. And the evidence base there, it will change over the years. But when you have a plan and the first time ever, a 30 year plan for transport uh, in the north of England, you know, you need to follow it uh, and you need to see the money that comes with that to be able to deliver it. Very much so just playing to uh, Kevin's uh, uh, point about uh, third sector, sort of third party investment. Uh, why not? Absolutely. Look at the stations that we are proposing to build in Northern Powerhouse Rail. Big retail opportunities, uh, get the money in early. Uh, I think that's really important as, a, as an opportunity. Uh, for third party investment and something that we definitely would want to explore further. And one of the other key points for me is the sort of small to medium uh, enterprise businesses. We want to be around 60% in Northern Powerhouse Rail because that's where the innovations are, the ingenuity is, and we want to bring that to the fore. So very much in the construction stage, in the risk management, we want to get that right up front to make sure that we don't hit the problems that other mega rail jobs we have seen in the past um, uh, start to encounter. We want to understand all those issues really early to make sure this is the number and this is the programme and we continue to move at pace. Great. Um, now I'm just going to do one more uh, question and then in introduce some new members of the panel. Uh, but I think uh, this is from Laurie Quinn and it's can Ben say what his hopes are for the outputs from the upcoming white paper on devolution and recovery, and um, given its recent postponement of the budget 2020? So I suppose when we might get something, given all the uncertainty. Ben? Um, I'm not sure when we're going to get it. Um, I was hoping to be later this year, and it still may be later this year. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I would like to just see a further move towards devolution and it's not full devolution because you, you can't just hand a whole lot of powers to a system that doesn't really understand them or have the ability to control them i think i've always been very clear that devolution is kind of an earned autonomy thing that if you get a set of powers you can prove that you can use them and then more and more will come i think um, the government's agenda of making sure that there are metro mayors across the whole of the north of england um, is a good one and i hope that continues at a pace Hopefully Kevin can tell me more about North Yorkshire, but if we can ever get North Yorkshire or Yorkshire over the line would be great. There's places like Warrington and, uh, Warrington and Cheshire, um, other parts of the North East that need deals. Because you do find now, even within the North, there's another two track system that's appearing because government does like engaging with Metro mayors. They find it quite straightforward to engage with. We've got a very simple brief. Um, even officials within Whitehall like um, combined authorities because they see us as a delivery of arm of government and we're working better and better as months and years go by with central government. So what you're finding is there's disproportionate investment, which I, you know, from my point of view is a good thing, coming into places like Teesside and actually places like North Yorkshire at the moment because it hasn't got itself to the table is falling slightly further behind. So a recommitment to that. 
Um, hopefully an acceleration of that, um, I think is really, really important. Um, and I think for this, the purposes of this uh, conversation, I think that's about it. I think as well, I would just, one of the things that I think has slowed down further devolution in parts of the North of England is now the potential convolution of conversations about local government reorganization with devolution and Metro mayors. Um, and I think there is a there is a good in having Metro mayors as a system, irrespective of local government relocation. But you, you're actually seeing, for example, in North Yorkshire, it seems to be predicated on having both, which stops it in its tracks because it's difficult enough getting a devolution deal over the line as it is, never mind asking a local area to then reorganize locally as well. So I'm going to stop there because I think Kevin is probably a better place to go into the detail of that than I. Yeah, Kevin, do you want to jump in before well, I just get the rest of the panel? Then? It's the next panel's time, but uh, North Yorkshire is mentioned so often that it's, um, listen, I'm a massive believer in devolution. And I'm not just saying it's Ben's on the call, Ben's doing a brilliant job. And what mayors are all about is identifying the right kind of uh, projects in their area they can really then be passionate about and attract investment for. And we've seen that working all over the country, but nowhere better we've seen that than Tees Valley. So um, I'm told the North Yorkshire deal was being, a letter was being sent out last week and obviously it didn't arrive. So I, I imagine it's, it's due any day, but um, yeah, I mean, it's not, for me, unitaries make perfect sense. So, and rather than two-tier government anyway, irrespective of the mayor, I put it that way, Ben. And if you're going to reorganise it, you might as well reorganise it all at the same time. Um, but if I have to have one or the other, I'd go for the devolution. I'd go for the mayor, no question about it, and leave the two tiers in place if that had to happen. But for me, just get it all done at once and let's get on with things. Frustration here, being in business for 30 years, frustration going into politics, if you don't, just get on with things. And that's one more thing I'd like to get on with. Brilliant, thank you. Now, um, I'm just gonna add some new members to our panel. It's obviously great if everyone are currently on the call, uh, on the fringe can stick around because we're gonna try and get through more questions. But just for now, I just want to invite, uh, so we've got Henry Morrison, director of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership. Uh, we have Claire Haig, chief executive of Greener Journeys. And uh, we have David Clark, technical director of the Railway Industry Association, and also Simon, who we heard from earlier. But just with our, our new, I suppose our second stage panelists, um, I just want to invite you to give some opening remarks on, you know, what are the new and recent set priorities to build back better transport in the north so all we're talking about a in terms of coronavirus but also that environmental agenda i'd just love to get your opening remarks um perhaps uh, we could do ladies first and start with you claire uh, you might need to unmute yourself thank you good morning everyone um so yes so connect and um, so covid19 has turned the world upside down and it's really challenged many of our prior assumptions um, my comments are really going to focus on how, irrespective of, of the, the turmoil we're experiencing, the case for mass transit remains as strong as ever. Um, and in fact, you know, investing in HS2, Northern Powerhouse Rail, bus networks across the north is going to be integral um, to the government's levelling up agenda, to achieving net zero, um, and to building back better. So that's my opening you know, statement, really. Um, it's not clear. I mean, we, of course, none of us knows what the long term impact of COVID-19 is going to be on public transport. In the short term, it's been devastating. Um, and without doubt, COVID-19 has accelerated some um, structural changes in the economy. Pre-existing changes have been, which, you know, such as working from home, which we really should be harnessing um, to assist in a green recovery. Um, and the massive increase in walking and cycling is also much to be welcomed. And we, ne we need to make sure that we lock in those changes and benefits as well in terms of air quality, etc. However, um, it would be a serious mistake um, to argue that any of this lessens the case for investing in public transport. Um, and the central point really from the, from the green agenda, um, that rising demand for car and van travel is the central reason why transport emissions in the UK remain stubbornly high. Um, 
a double-decker bus can take 75 cars off the road. And when we're looking at the levelling up agenda, public transport connectivity is absolutely crucial. Um, a 10% improvement in bus in public transport connectivity is associated with a 3.6% reduction in social deprivation. And car use in the north is actually especially high because public transport urgently needs investment and upgrading. And to the comments on devolution, this will require better, greater devolution. Um, you know, properly funded and, and empowered city, region, and transport authorities will be critical um, to the levelling up agenda and to delivering better transport in the north. Um, we also need to reduce the need for travel. We can't be mobility junkies. It's, it's not travel for the sake of it. A more nuanced approach is going to be needed with you know, greater emphasis on urban villages as well. Um, so land use planning, integrating sustainable transport with housing and land use planning, going to be crucial for, for reducing emissions. And, you know, there's a powerful case for investing in broadband um, instead of that 27 billion roads budget um, to make it easier for people to work from home. This, of course, will have to go alongside a more efficient system for freight and logistics. Uh, because otherwise, you know, growing internet shopping and the traffic and slow, uh, it, tr slower, slower traffic is going to be bringing our traffic speeds right down. And of course, in nose to tail traffic, emissions from vehicles increase fourfold. So we've really got to, to tackle that one. Um, but, but the big one, really, there, there can be no sustainable transport system without road pricing. Um, Manchester emphatically rejected congestion charging in 2006. This will, be, this will need to be looked at again. Um, and at a time of record low oil prices, you know, the Chancellor really should take the opportunity to increase fuel duty. And our research shows that the freeze in fuel duty since 2011 has caused 5% more traffic, 5 million additional tonnes of CO2 emissions, a quarter of a billion fewer bus journeys, and 75 million fewer rail journeys. So it's really very much about getting the price signals right as well and setting that overall picture. But in summary, um, we are clearly going through unprecedented un and very unsettled and uncertain times. With a, now with the second wave upon us, I think the impact on public transport, we're like levels of usage is likely to plummet again. So we're certainly not out of the woods by a long shot. But I say again, the fundamentals haven't changed. If we are going to build back better in the North and across the UK, we need a massive shift from private transport to public shared and active travel. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, now, Henry, I'm gonna bring you at this point uh, to, for your opening remarks and obviously to pick up on anything just said. No, it's been a great conversation so far. And it's particularly good to have uh, Ben Houchen as one of our, our Metro mayors with us, because in reality, transport in the North of England, uh, not just through transport for the North, but through our transport authorities and through the Metro mayoral deals is now not just a an issue for government it's an issue for the north itself and the the, the strides that we made on improving connectivity in the Tees Valley are an example of the power of those mayoral deals and I think that's certainly something we'll see in North Yorkshire where if you look at an economy like Scarborough uh, which is one of the key parts of kind of where some of the growth could come probably one of the most archetypal left behind towns in Britain uh, with its connectivity issues well the reality is that that you need that focus and that investment to be able to bring the people with the lowest median wages in the country to some of the best paid jobs in the country and where there's the highest cost of living in York. Does that make sense? So the reality is we need that local investment and, and Kevin's Road, the A64 along with improved uh, rail services are part of that. And I think I would say, I take Ben's point about multimodal solutions. And I think there is a point that we are obviously going to build more roads in the recovery because they're they're quicker to build than railways, but that will mean, and we have to make choices that we maybe won't spend as much as roads in future periods. Does that make sense? I think that balance between roads and rail has to be flexible. And that's one of the reasons we think that the roads and rail budget for the North should be combined. We shouldn't have a roads budget and a rail budget. We should have a Northern transport budget allocated to transport for the North for strategic roads, for local transport given to our Metro mayors. And I would agree with Claire on the point about road pricing. I think you're going to have to probably get rid of fuel duty if you have road pricing because it would probably be a, a replacement for it um, and I don't we've said uh, probably quite controversially that that should be retained income in the north of England I don't see why if we ask people to pay a, a charge based on when they drive and where they drive and obviously that's to avoid disproportionately tackling 
those in rural areas, for instance, who've got no choice but to use the private car and also to encourage people to travel at less busy times a day, which obviously reduces air quality issues. All of that needs to be done in a way that's fair and proportionate to those on the lowest incomes. And actually, um, fuel duty is a pretty uh, blunt tool to do that. Road pricing is a much more effective way of giving the price signals Claire talks about, but without perhaps causing the political downsides to a government that introduced it. And I think uh, one of the kind of real choices we've got to make in a world where I mean, I'm an electric vehicle driver, I don't pay any fuel duty, so I'm a bit of a freeloader now uh, on the road network, is that you have to find a way to charge the many more people who are going to stop paying fuel duty to use the roads because uh, my my road tax definitely isn't paying Katie for my road usage. So the Treasury have got a problem there that they need to find a replacement. And I think Rishi could be very bold, actually, in his budget next year. This isn't all about price rises uh, and tax increases. I think there are some strategic things he could do which are about really empowering the North. Because what I don't want is levelling up to be just jam spread thinner. That's the risk of, of, of levelling up because you can just take the jam from London like civil servant jobs and just spread them north. Now, that's a nice thing you can do and you can do that in three and a half years. You can move a few things around, but we want to grow the cake in the north. We want more jam, not just for us, but actually for London. I don't want everything the north gets to be just something that someone else used to have. I want us to grow our economy. I think that's the type of economic vision that certainly was behind the original Northern Powerhouse project. And it's in that lineage that you see a lot of the investment and the job creation going on in Ben's area, but also in some of the other metro mayoral areas. And I would say the, the Sheffield City region, now they've got their deal, taking a very similar approach to an economy that has similarities in its manufacturing base uh, to the Tees Valley and absolutely creating new jobs uh, using the investment they have. And the reality is that transport infrastructure, as Kevin alludes to, is just one tool in economic rebalancing. It's not the only tool uh, alongside skills and employment. It's a massive prerequisite, but you then need to have our metro mayors empowered to invest in industries that are going to create the, the actual jobs because the transport does generate some employment as Tim rightly referenced, but the real jobs come from the productivity benefits you get from having a better connected North of England because people want to invest here exactly the way that Simon's customers would want to invest more in the Humber if it had those links and better, for instance, uh, freight links across the Pennines. Those are the things we need to see. And I think that uh, devolution and the decentralisation of power is as important as money, Katie, because actually there's a lot of money spent in the north of England on dealing with the costs of economic failure right now. What we need to see is the levers of control given to those like Ben and his colleagues um, and to uh, organisations like Transport for the North and through the new Northern Transport Acceleration Council, because it's the ability to control existing spending, not just new men, new spending in areas like transport that will make a big difference. Because Highways England, Network Rail have big budgets in the north of England, but it, it's not under the control of northern leaders, and that does need to change. And we can't wait a decade like the National Infrastructure Commission think we should. We need to be starting to make that change in the budget next year, not later than that. Brilliant. Thank you, Henry. And I think the, that everyone have their own cake policy will, I'm sure, be very popular. Um, now, I'm just going to come to David, uh, Technical Director at the Railway Industry Association, um, for your um, remarks on this. And then briefly go to Simon, then we're going to try and take some live questions, because I've got lots coming up for the panel. Um, so over to you, David. Uh, thanks, Katie, and good morning, everybody. I think we're all agreed transport, including rail, has got a huge role to play in levelling up. Um, uh, we've talked about how public transport can unlock economic opportunity and reduce social deprivation, and it supports jobs indirectly and directly in terms of the construction, which is obviously what uh, uh, my members are, uh, are involved in. Um, I don't think that's any less true following the corona coronavirus and pandemic. Um, it's probably no surprise that public transport revenues down when we're actively discouraging people from using public transport. Uh, I don't disagree that's for the right reasons, but we can see that uh, transport demand still exists by the fact uh, that road transport has substantially recovered. So I think the demand's there. And I think in the north, we ha <coughs> excuse me, we had a latent demand anyway. Um, I don't think we could say that uh, the uh, transport network was over provided in the, for in the north. And therefore, I think if we were to get on with the projects that we've been thinking about for so many years, then I think that uh, that that there'd be no doubt that they would they would be uh, used and would uh, drive modal shift. 
At the risk of stating the obvious, uh, investment projects like that take time to build, so we can't afford to uh, uh, to hesitate in pressing ahead with getting getting on the, with those projects in order to build back Northern Transport better. So the exam question I think today is what are the reset priorities? Um, and I would say those are to accelerate what we were already planning, things like Trans, uh, Transpennine and the early uh, Northern Powerhouse projects that, uh, that Tim was talking about. We also, as Ben highlighted, need to be better at our public messaging. Um, you know, we, the, he used the example, we've been very poor to explain the benefits of HS2. The messaging has been, just been completely, completely uh, uh, misconstrued. And to give you an idea of, of the potential impact of getting on with this investment, um, the Northern Rail Industry Leaders, which uh, an organization we support, estimated that Tim's program alone would generate another 10,000 jobs in the supply chain, adding 600 million to the regional GVA per annum on top of the, uh, uh, the 3.4 billion that Northern Powerhouse Rail it's, itself is expected to deliver. And who knew we've already got 50,000 rail supply chain employees in the Northern Powerhouse area. Those are good jobs, they're high, highly paid jobs, and we can have a lot more of those. But at the moment, as we hesitate, we're losing jobs. So rail, rail can clearly be a big part of a green recovery we could get on and invest in a rolling program of electrification in the north we could complement that with hydrogen and battery trains for the less intensively used routes and that's going to create not just new jobs but also new industrial capacity and capability in the north what we need is some early and clear signals in order to be able to get on with this thank you Brilliant, thank you. Now, I just want to come back to you, Simon, um, because we're talking about this green agenda and what role um, various uh, infrastructure transport can play in it. So I wondered with um, free ports, what role do you think they can play in reaching net zero and I suppose more generally leveling up? Well, we haven't covered free ports as part of this discussion yet, and the government has, has started a consultation process. They talked about granting Freeport status for up to 10 locations around the country. And, and you know, the, the, the media is talking about there are a, 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 a much larger number of uh, potential applicants for, for Freeport status. Back to, to carbon. I mean, the Humber is the largest producer of carbon in the, in the, city, in, in the country. We've got two large refineries here. We've got uh, Bristol, Scunthorpe, and of course, Drax uh, producing power, which is... Uh, it is what it is, but it's also a massive opportunity in terms of driving the, the debate around carbon capture, uh, around the, the network will capture the carbon to uh, capture the carbon and store it in the caverns off the, off the coast in the North Sea, but also the production of green hydrogen, uh, blue hydrogen. We, it, it is, these are billion pound schemes with some very large uh, global players involved with it. And the, the Humber ports being, being where, where we are, both north and south of the Humber, uh, will be the facilitator in that. The infrastructure capturing the carbon is it will, will no doubt be on the uh, on the, the dock estate and linked to those those generators. But if I if I may just case, I, I mean there's been, we had a lot of discussion about rail and this is a, a slight frustration from the, the transport freight sector, which I've been in this port game for a very long time, having started my career in Merseyside before I I, I went south and came over here five years ago. We still do not have that east-west freight connectivity. And if a uh, if someone wanting to import a container through Hull and get it to Manchester, it's still the quickest way to stick it on a truck, which just clogs up the M62. We've really got to make some progress on that uh, and look at freight alongside passengers and not freight as a second priority to passengers. Great, thank you. Um, now we have a great question here from Paul Hal, uh, I believe the MP for Sedgefield. Um, it says, what would the panel see as the pipeline sequencing? Uh, the computer starts to slow down as I look at it. Um, yep, yeah, so you've got, what would the panel see as the pipeline sequence of transport investment to deliver the public or private sector investment and pace? And then we have a second question here from Simon Bennett, which is, can the panelists prioritize one, um, I'm gonna keep it at one, thing which will make a difference for any part of the population of the North within this parliament? And I think that question goes to what you were talking about earlier, Ben, which is the fact that you can have long-term projects, but if Boris Johnson is gonna do what he wants to do and win a fifth term, 
them. Um, you, you need to have something else you can show by the time of the next election. So I thought if we could go along the panel and ultimately, if you could each tell me one thing, I'll, I'll bring you in that you think will make a difference for uh, any part of the population in North in this parliament. And then also uh, for those who have a view on it, um, when we're talking about public and private sector investment, um, looking at that question from Paul Howell about the pipeline sequencing for that. Because um, as we'll say, it's a good thing, but how do we exactly get there? Um, ben, should we start with you? Uh, well, the one thing I think that would benefit the people of my area most would be for the government to give um, the former Reca Steelworks site, the South Tees Development Corporation, free port status, which would be the single largest free port in the country. We know that there are other um, very deserving areas that should be free ports as well. I mean, if the UK government want to go even further, they can make the whole UK a free port, but I don't necessarily think the UK government's in that space at the moment. Uh, okay. But that would, that would just, I mean, that would do everything that Kevin talked about. It sets the framework, the regulatory framework for to attract private sector investment, which leads to good quality jobs, which would also accelerate the need for better public transport, better road connectivity, better port infrastructure, which I think is also part of the Prime Minister's announcement today around offshore wind. Um, and one of the really interesting things about the offshore wind argument that, that seems, I think, in the last 24 hours to have transformed it is the fact that, you know, we were competing with the Humber as to be the offshore wind um, centre for offshore wind manufacturing. You know, given that Boris wants to power every home with offshore wind, I think it's no longer a case of either or, it's both. Um, and I think the capacity is going to be absolutely needed. And if I can be really cheeky, Katie, and talk about something that I think, think would benefit the whole of the North rather than just a part. Okay, of one, but okay. Uh, I'll, I'll just take the opportunity. Um, I think uh, this, this whole government reorganisation, relocation of government departments would benefit the whole of the North, because the sooner you can get those departments into the North of England and understand the challenges that the North faces, uh, compared to, you know, living in London and having that horrible commute on the tube from one side to the other, that's a very different challenge to, you know, the fact that we're lucky if a bus or a train turns up once every half an hour, if it's on time and hasn't been cancelled, and then you cram in everybody on like sardines, you know, the fact that the road infrastructure could be better. And I think just to emphasise that point as well, when I talk about the relocation into the north of England, I mean into the north of England outside of a major city, because Man the, the, the problems that Manchester face are very similar to those of London, but they're very different to those faced by, by the people of Middlesbrough, of Scarborough, of Sunderland, um, you know, of Cumbria. And so if government really want to have better long term policy development, the people developing the policy need to be living and breathing what it's like to be living in large parts of the north of England. Um, and I think that would transform the, the long term future of, of government policy making while also delivering some short term job creation as well. Brilliant, thank you. And um, Henry, do you want to come in with your uh, one idea for this? <laughs> <clears throat> I think I think a, a full hearted commitment to build the whole of the the HS2 Northern Powerhouse Rail Network is, is something this Chancellor can do. And as he and the Prime Minister have championed the case for improving connectivity across the Pennines, and in that first speech Boris Johnson made as Prime Minister, where Ben and I were sitting there uh, listening to, to what he had to say, he made the case for how that would benefit the whole of the North of England. And I think th the reality is that does mean you can start elements of that, like the upgraded line between uh, Newcastle, uh, Darlington and York, which is a prerequisite for HS2 getting to the northeast of England before you build the new line, which I think does speak a bit to Ben's agenda around things that you can get started a bit more quickly, because in reality, some of those things are not a decade away, they're only a few years away, and that, that would bring huge improvements, even just in terms of improving the conventional rail connectivity of the northeast, which I think is a real barrier to, to be able to be a civil servant, I mean, outside of, of some of those bigger cities at the moment, it'd be very challenging to get those people around the country easily. So you need to have that better connectivity if that is the aspiration that you've got. And a place like Darlington is very well connected, but it, it could be a lot better connected without spending huge sums of money in the medium term. And that's something that I think we would certainly support and, and think is the right thing to do. I think Paul's point about sequencing is really important because we need an, an independent delivery body for those high speed rail lines beyond what HS2 will build. So it's now clear they're not going to build phase 2B as a company. Uh, we haven't got anyone to build the new lines yet of NPR. And I think we need to have an independent body of government. So a bit like the Olympic delivery agency was that isn't subject to day to day kind of interference bluntly from politicians that can be given a pot of money and a job to do over 30 years and, and left to get on with it and do it in the cheapest and most efficient way. And that includes uh, building in the supply chain opportunities that uh, were referenced earlier by Tim. So I think that would be my suggestion because I think 
if the government tries to do the sequencing, I'm, I'm sure they can get in Paul's train station, a great place to build a train station, Ferry Hill. So those things I'm sure government can sequence and, and get into the, the programme. But the huge necessary new lines we need to build, I bluntly don't trust the government to do that itself. I want a group of uh, professionals and the private sector to be brought in with the public sector scrutiny and supervision to do that job for us, because I don't think that a bunch of civil servants, wherever we might place them, should be taking all those granular decisions. I actually, think that should be done apart from government by people who've got more expertise. Brilliant. Kevin, I'm going to bring you in at this point. Um, I noticed in the chat when uh, we've had one other question, which was about, you know, will Whitehall, does Whitehall as, as a block have faith in devolution? You, said, you replied saying, uh, depends who you mean, very few people relinquish power voluntarily. Um, so I wanted to, um, on that, I mean, it, it touched on the idea of uh, giving power to other people and actually going with devolvement. So what's the one thing you think, one project you could have, in, uh, which would help the most people in this parliament in terms of those in the north? And do we trust, uh, I suppose, Westminster to hand the power to do that? I think you might be muted, so you might need to unmute. So you hear that. I start on the second point first, if I can, is that I think that shows the political bravery of George Osborne and David Cameron, who started devolution. You know, it was a Steve Hilton policy, but nobody's done it before. And we might, and we keep talking about we're very centralised. We run our uh, politics in the UK. Uh, government is very centralised, and that's because it, we've always done it that way. And this was devolution was a very brave move, and. Lots of people, because lots of the devolution was given given away by conservative government to a Labour area. So I think we should, we should be commended, uh, the politicians anyway, commended for that. We want them to continue to do that. And inevitably, some people in Whitehall, particularly in the civil service, I think, will be resistant to it because that's chipping away at their power base. So, um, so that's why I say it depends who you're talking to. So, well, let's keep the momentum and... and uh, I know Rishi is very, very keen on devolution. So let's, let's see it, uh, hope it continues and we see the devolution deals for North Yorkshire and elsewhere. Um, in terms of our one thing, well, I'm going to go back to what I said before, super enterprise zones. Um, back to the East Germany, West Germany example, there were huge incentives for companies in West Germany to move to East Germany to try and level up, as well as money going into public sector in terms of transport and the like. Treasury has a bit of a problem with this because it sees it as a zero sum game. It's back to Henry's point about just spreading the jam more thinly. I, I don't buy that actually. I think the reality of business, people invest as long as they get back more than the cost of capital. So if you lower the cost of capital, then you make it more attractive to pe people will invest more in the first place. So there's a, it's not a zero sum game. There's an attraction there to start up additional enterprises or scale up additional enterprise in, in those locations. There's bound to be some kind of people just relocate, take advantage of the tax benefits, but that's gonna be quite modest, I think. Generally, it'll be new businesses, new initiatives, and, um, and that's what we need. So it's, it's about business rates, uh, relief, it's about capital allowances, which are massive. If you give businesses 100% capital allowances, so everything they spend is knocked off their profit for that year, that's massive. And yet it would, it would encourage a huge amount of money investment in the north. And you know, this is what we've got to do. And you do that so quickly. Um, and again, the other thing, the regional mutual banks can have a massive impact in making sure SMEs uh, could borrow money, get access to finance, uh, invest and prosper in these places where we need them to do that in the north. Brilliant, thank you. Claire, do you want to come in now uh, with what you think um, when, when we're looking at, you know, what should be prioritised in the in the short term, so not so much the 10, 20 year projects, but the ones that you can say by the next election, look, things have improved. So a massive boost for bus travel, massive, massive investment in bus. I mean, the government has committed to a national bus strategy, so we you know, we wait to hear. Um, the Prime Minister has is a self-declared bus nut. He has described himself. He, he makes buses out of cardboard, and genuinely, as Mayor of London, saw how crucial buses were. And I think this is actually um, something that really, I mean, really, in terms of sequencing, really needs to. We need to move fast on this. And I'm just going to give you just a few little supporting points. So prior to COVID, um, bus was the primary mode of access to city centres. Bus commuters were generating 64 billion in term in goods and services every year. And 
really important for this levelling up agenda. We know from our research that 77% of job seekers and 87% of all young job seekers have no access to a car, van or motorbike and are completely reliant on their local transport, which in most cases is bus. So, you know, for every economic, environmental um, and social um, and quick win, because the great thing about investing in bus is you really can turn it around very, very quickly. And an invest investment in bus infrastructure, we've also got evidence to show can deliver um, eight pounds, eight pounds of wider economic benefit, including all those decongestion, et cetera, for every one pound invested. So it's, that's my plug for the bus. Brilliant, thank you. Um, now I'm just going through the panel. Uh, so that's now, uh, please go to Tim. Um, what do you think in terms of what's gonna be the thing that's gonna, you know, uh, make the biggest impact in the short term? I think for me, as Transport for the North, we laid out in our economic recovery plan uh, some real opportunities, some very early opportunities of, of, of a list of uh, a list of infrastructure that could be done uh, within this short period of time that we've, we've got right now ahead of us. Um, but, you know, the, the big plug for me is it can't be right that Bradford to Leeds is eight miles and takes 21 minutes on a train. So therefore, it's actually allowing Northern Powerhouse Rail the investment money it needs to get that spade in the ground in 2024 and complete the first lot of stations, the Barnsley Dome Valley, the Rotherham Midland Main Line, also uh, up at Darlington, Darlington 2025, get that station completed uh, and ready to really start to open up that piece of the economy as well. A lot of early wins available. We just need to see through the CSR, uh, the investment and the money coming forward. Great. Now, I want to go to come to Andy next, but just before I do, because I, I believe, Ben, at some point you have to be on a conference stage, or maybe, maybe I don't have to read the agenda. Um, I just want to, we've got a quick follow up for you, which is which government department would you relocate first? Um, I'm personally quite interested in the answer to this one, so fast track. <laughs> well, if I could choose, I, I think it's outside of my remit to choose. Um, I would, I, you'd obviously want Treasury, wouldn't you? Because the sooner you can get Treasury, the, the idea is that other departments want to be re relocated next to them and therefore you don't just get treasury, you get others. Um, and we know that Rishi is a, a, a huge supporter of wanting to, to relocate large parts of treasury out of London. And uh, given that he's a neighbouring MP, I do have uh, as much as opportunity as I can to, to lobby him to do so. So hopefully we can still we can still deliver that sooner rather than later. Probably a little bit harder for him to get back at, at, the, at the moment. <laughs> no, uh, with that, no, that's please go. Andy, let's come to you now on that question about what can be done in the short term. Obviously, you're coming in more from the aviation perspective. In this yeah, discussion. I've already talked about our wholehearted support for HS2 and NPR. I think on the immediate priority and what you could do to move the dial now, I'd very much chime with what others have said about the potential for sort of various tax policies to help with that. Um, we also own and operate uh, London Stansted and East Midlands airports. I think looking at the different uh, aviation dynamics across the country, what's really obviously different is some of the big airports in the Southeast um, are more about choosing which routes they want to run with the capacity that they've got. Whereas every other airport in the country is fighting tooth and nail to win new connectivity. It would make a real difference in the short term to our ability to win those routes if there was more um, supportive policies to allow us to compete internationally. So that's, I wanted to build a bit on what Kevin was saying about drawing in uh, investment to, from the private sector. There is also an international competitiveness of the UK in that space. I think Brexit presents a real opportunity for us as a country to compete for business from other countries if we get our policy right. And whether that's in from an aviation perspective, in, in freight terms, East Midlands is a massive freight airport and Freeport policy could do great things for us there. Or in passenger terms around things like the taxation on, on passenger tickets or the new tax free policy that the government has recently announced for after Brexit. These are all things that levers you could pull that would make a difference within months and years. As soon as we're at the other side of this coronavirus pandemic and the harsh travel restrictions, we can be winning that those routes for the north rather than seeing them go to European countries instead. Brilliant, thank you. Um, David, do you want to come in on this? Okay, yes, thank you. So to get results by 2024, um, I think we need to commit this year to a programme of rail investment. Uh, there's lots of projects that have been bubbling away for a long time, Transpennine, Northern Powerhouse, the Blythe and Tyne is one that could be delivered by 2024, and a rail decarbonisation uh, programme. 
Now, you might not think that all of those can deliver by 2024, but what they can deliver by 2024, uh, if we commit, is a lot of apprentices. We can commence the de design work, which is high value. We can co commence a lot of preparatory site work, uh, and there's extra access opportunity at the moment to do that with uh, less disruption. We can start to introduce uh, hydrogen battery trains to, uh, to move forward on decarbonisation. And right now, we've got a great opportunity to promote the use of rail. We need to promote it to get people back on trains. Uh, but we've got a fantastic fleet of new trains in Transpennine and Northern, which the public hardly noticed because just as they were arriving, along came coronavirus. Uh, so as we come out of that, let's let's use that fantastic new f uh, fleet to encourage people back on back on trains. Let's be uh, you know really aggressive about our marketing, trying to to bring people back into tra onto trains and start to drive that modal shift. Brilliant, thank you. Now, um, we're going to come to Simon for his closing remarks because we are running to the end of this session. So I'm hoping in that, Simon, you can incorporate uh, what, what you think would have probably in the short term have the biggest effect. Just before we do, um, I've been told we can try and do live questions. So this could be completely disastrous, so bear with us. Um, but basically, if someone wants to raise their hand who's listening to discussion and ask a live question, um, we will try and get you to, so we can actually hear, hear you you ask it um, if anyone does that and if not I have other questions I can read so we're looking for hands uh, otherwise uh, in the meantime uh, I think we'll go to just here yeah I think we had an interesting one here from Jill Morris which is how much faith did the panel have in the Northern Transport Acceleration Council and how will it work with transport for the North and um, can I have my panel actually physically wave at me if they would like to answer this question Otherwise, I will assign it. Great, Henry, you're in. Okay, that's who you can say. No, I think, I mean, we we called along sort of back after the timetable chaos uh, in a report we did on, on that in 2018 for sort of this concept of kind of joint responsibility. So we, we're big advocates for full devolutions. I banged on about of, of money and that come, what comes with that is decision-making power. But in the, in the short term, it's very hard to take every project in the north from government and just start doing it directly. So we think the Northern Transport Acceleration Council has the benefit that as you're waiting to take responsibility for projects, for something like Transpennine Route Upgrade, which has huge benefits across the north uh, in terms of improving that corridor, which prevents people currently on the existing line going east to west if, if they want to. Uh, as a passenger uh, between the northeast New Yorkshire and the northwest and vice versa. Well, it should be political leaders across those parts of the country who have the influence over how that project's developed. And I think NTAC gives the opportunity to give uh, northern leaders more of a say over how those things are prioritised. And some of the great ideas we've heard from people, uh, including uh, Paul and others uh, on the chat, but also some of the panellists around doing projects during the shutdown uh, and when we were in the initial lockdown from March. Well, if you'd had an NTAC then, you could have been starting some of those conversations with government much more quickly and having the ability to have a bit more influence over some of that, not necessarily the, the size of the pie, KT, and the amount of money we've got to spend, but exactly how it's spent. Um, and I think Rishi's always telling us as the Chancellor, he wants the North to take more tough choices. He's certainly very clear with me and, and the business community about that. I think we, we want that. We want to be given, if they are sometimes a scarce resource, I'd much rather that Northern leaders decide how to prioritise, say, £3 billion to improve connectivity across the Pennines than some middle-ranking civil servant in the Department of Transport telling us what we can and can't have. That isn't how it should work. We, we need to trust the people who've been elected now, more and more of the metro mayors with that really clear mandate from the public to, to lead these decisions and to have the influence over how these priorities are made. Brilliant, thank you. Um, now, at this point, I just want to go to, because uh, we are reaching the end of our time. So thanks again for all your contributions. Um, so Simon, if, if I could come to you, just for your closing remarks um, on this discussion, uh, thinking about what everyone said, and also that question uh, in terms of uh, what what you think could have probably have the most impact and benefit the North in the short term. Well, if you allow me to answer the, the, you didn't ask my one view, so I'll give you my one yeah, view. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as someone who no, I'm private sector I run a business I'm running a business to make a profit and, and when we look at some of the the issues around Brexit obviously Covid 
But the government needs to be clear on legislation and needs to be consistent on legislation. The private sector will have no hesitation in investing if it can see clarity around the, the legislation that governs that investment. And with the, for all the reasons we know about, that's been difficult around, around the Brexit discussions. Uh, uh, but, but, but there are opportunities and the government has a role to play there in creating an environment which, which actually gives clarity uh, for those who are wishing to invest. But look, in terms of, of general summing up, I, I, our, our politicians on the call, uh, I, I, I agree with in, in terms of uh, getting more decision making in the north, as Henry just said, there's, there's far too much driven out of Whitehall with civil servants, and it was a piece in one of the papers over the weekend, you know, that the view in Whitehall of what should be done in the north, well, it's the north should be deciding what, what happens in the north uh, in terms of investment um, and the priorities for, for those investments in the north. I think we've got to make some hard decisions, and this is where it gets unpopular. Not not every part of the north is going to get is going to get a, a piece of the cake, a piece of the investment, and it needs to be prioritised. You've got to look where the where the bang for the buck is, and and I would say this, but that central corridor from the east to west, from the Humber side to Mersey uh, on rail, is a is a key key driver, which is going to unlock potential on the M62 as as well as for freight, but also for passengers. But if you want to go from Grimsby to London, you've got to go an hour's train to Doncaster. You've got to go west before you go go south. And if you want to go to Manchester from Grimsby, you, 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 you may as well drive. So there's an awful lot to go at here. But I do agree with, our, with what the politicians have said. Let's get that decision making in the north. And then for the north itself, which is a, which is a massive area, as we all know, you know from Cumbria down to, to Merseyside, from here on the Humber up into to the borders of Scotland, it's huge. Uh, we're not always going to be aligned in what our priorities are. And it's as you then break into combined authorities and, and mayors as Ben is and, and, and others, you, you've got to have a sort of a, a grown up debate about where that investment is going. It's back to my earlier point in terms of being clear in our priorities and what, what we're seeking to do. But to take all that away, what we all agree on is the North does need to, to, to benefit by the levelling up policy that the government is, is saying it wants to do. But then the government's got to deliver on that. And it could make some decisions quite quickly around the offshore wind sector. And I'll be listening, uh, as I know, I know that Ben will today, about what the Prime Minister is going to say about, about offshore wind. And I equally agree, there's vast potential for offshore wind in the North Sea and a lot of ports, mine, Teesside, and actually down in, in, in the further south, will play a role in, in developing that, that sector, both in manufacturing, manufacturing the blades here on the Humber, to supporting the uh, the the, the maintenance and, and servicing of those blades in, in the North Sea. Uh, but jobs are key. Jobs, investment uh, is key to, to the levelling up. And that's where Freeports has a role to play. The, I, I hear that the Treasury is, is nervous that Freeports will see the government will lose money, that they, you know, it's part of, part of the Freeport discussion is that you're, you're free of duty until you enter the UK market or you're re-exported. Uh, my... my my suggestion, my, my plea to, to the Treasury and indeed the government was be bold, be bold about free ports. Don't try and look at look at addressing the, the issues that may go wrong. Look at what you can achieve by having free port status. Uh, yes, Ben's thought about making the entire UK a free port. Well, uh, yeah, well, that'd be worth debating, wouldn't it? But actually, I think capping it at 10 is too small. Uh, and equally, having a having a debate about what the real drivers, the real opportunities are, as opposed to worrying about losing an element of the of the tax or the duty of, of goods which are coming into the UK market uh, out of um, out of the free port. But from if I may, from my point of view, Katie, really good debate. Really, really pleased from uh, that everyone had a, had a chance to to put their views across. So well done you for doing so. We've got a vast amount to do in the north, uh, and I think we're all one thing we do share up in in the vision and the uh, I guess the objective is to ensure the north gets its fair share of uh, for what's going on in this country, both investment and opportunities. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Simon, um, for for your closing remarks there. And we've had some great feedback on the panel as we've gone on. Uh, a lot of people saying, you know, yes, the need to get shovels digging in the north now, uh, pushing to get things going and doing so quickly. Um, so that I want to thank you to thank you to AV Ports for organising the Fringe. Um, I'd like to thank our panel. So thank you uh, in no particular order. Thank you to Ben, Tim, Andy, Kevin, Henry, Claire, 
David and Simon, um, all for your contributions. It's been great and very much hope that next year we can do this again, but perhaps in person. Um, the tech has stood up, but um, uh, perhaps even just so we can get some bacon sandwiches before we start. Um, so <laughs> thank you all. And with that, I'm gonna end today's uh, discussion. So thanks again for joining and it will be up at a later date. Thank you.